Hello. Yeah, um, thanks uh, for, for the invitation. Um, yeah, so my name is Willy Doring. Uh, I'm the CEO of NeuroFox, and so uh, my background is computational neuroscience. And uh, so today, yes, I want to show you the Brain Duino project. Um, but before we take off, uh, of course, I would like to give you a little introduction into the topic. What is actually EEG BCI is electroencephalography. It's a way of measuring potentials on the surface of the head. And uh, so this had actually been discovered in the 20s uh, by a German physicist named Hans Berger. And so here we are 100 years later, and we are able to control robots with the power of our thoughts. Or we can also explore virtual reality, navigate uh, with our minds. And uh, since over five years, there are also now consumer devices. So isn't this amazing? So um, who here in the audience has a EG brain computer interface? Is there anybody here? Yeah, so it's not, <laughs> it's uh, still quite uh, early maybe for a regular consumer device. Um, so, but yeah, uh, so how does it actually work? We uh, measure, uh, we measure uh, from different locations um, and then we see those oscillations. Those are actually the, the brain waves and you can uh, analyze them through frequencies and looking also at the amplitude. And so depending on where we put the electrodes, so for instance in the frontal lobe we can look for decision-making processes or we look in the uh, parietal lobe on the, on the top basically where you have uh, motor uh, planning and also in the back of the head you can infer visual processing. And uh, so what, what kind of tools do we have at hand? Um, so for instance, there's motor imagery. This is a way where we can detect if you're thinking about moving your left hand or your right hand and um, trigger certain events with this. Then another technology is uh, steady state uh, visually evoked potentials, which is a way we can actually we can, uh, detect at which light source you're looking at by uh, knowing the frequency how it pulsating, and it reflects also in the EEG, actually. And um, yeah, and then it's also possible to use it as a remote control. Um, and so, like in this uh, particular example, so like the P300, we can use it um, to scroll, so we cycle through different uh, symbols, and if the one symbol you're thinking of is currently highlighted, it's possible to detect that and trigger something. And um, yeah, so the next there's neurofeedback. Neurofeedback is basically a way to train brainwave activity by the means of operant conditioning. So, and this can be seen in a way as a neural enhancement. So it can be used, for instance, to learn mindfulness and also meditation. That's one way to do it. So how it works, actually, we read uh, the brainwaves at the surface, then we do a filter filtering, basically, and so let's say you want to calm down, you want to have more, basically, very simplified, uh, the slow brainwave activity, and so every time you produce more of that, uh, you will actually get a sound. So that helps you actually to navigate towards those uh, uh, activity. And okay, and also it's fun actually at um, at uh, different places uh, we made installations, and you can make uh, also multiplayer games basically. So it's called uh, collective neurofeedback. So you uh, actually trigger sounds and visuals based on the group activity. And uh, yeah, so of course, um, you can also use it for more serious stuff. For instance, uh, looking at uh, the cognitive performance or also workload, uh, like we uh, just quickly talked about this in the introduction, um, a way maybe if, if something that you see is confusing to you or is it overwhelming you basically, um, this of a way of analyzing it through workload and also it can be used as a fingerprint. So, of course, but there are some limits, limits of course, here and challenges and, um, of course, the data can be very noisy. Um, I can show you also in a minute and, uh, and so that's why, you know, um, it's always a big challenge and uh, so the noise, of course, it, um, based on how you put the, the headset, basically, and also you have uh, factors like, let's say, loud conversation, something that disturbs you, um, and then also you have internal factors, like if you're very sleepy, this also changes the response, basically. So, but this is also a fun part for developers who are into machine learning, because there's always new things to discover, and uh, this is still in progress, of course. So what is the basic setup? So you have uh, the electrodes, then you have basically an amplifier, because it's a very weak signal, 
And uh, so then you filter it and you also digitize the signal. So this is currently on the hardware side. And then on the software side, you have things like machine learning, for instance, and uh, further processing. And um, so I will start uh, to talk about the Brain Reno project. Um, but I felt inclined to also talk about this. Um, so how is the technology in the future? And OK, so speaking of last year, there was actually a um, university was able to show that you can control a prosthetic limb, each finger individually. Um, for this, you need surgery. Um, so uh, maybe I understand like not everybody wants to do that. Um, but instead, you could also inject electrodes with an hero dust and um, monitor uh, certain activity, but also um, basically control. And um, then there's new laces. Uh, maybe you heard about this. Uh, Elon Musk is also currently uh, investing a lot of into this, like Brian Johnson too. Um, the idea is basically to get an artificial cognitive layer on top of the current one and being able to uh, compete with artificial intelligence in the future. Um, so this sounds a little bit crazy, but um, actually I think it's not so far-fetched. Also, if you're looking at what, uh, what DARPA, for instance, is doing currently um, to uh, actually um, restore certain memories at will and also to strengthen the connectivity between two areas of the brain. And then there's also optogenetics, which is a way to control brainwave activity just with light, right? And so with this technology at hand, you can see that um, the line between humans and machines are beginning to blur. And also with the progress of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, um, I think we can see that uh, there's new technologies, new wearables coming up. And so currently it looks like GPUs is the thing to do, um, to look at there, but if you look at also what other companies are doing, they're building uh, ASICs or neuromorphic chips, and they can do massive parallel processing um, and being very power sufficient at the same time. So if you consider this, I think we will really see a re revolution in uh, wearables. And so we're moving actually all the software, uh, all the software processing more to the hardware. And this opens up a lot of new applications. So especially in the interaction with, machi with machines. So like the human-machine interaction uh, will basically be completely new in this way. We will have assistants that are able to understand us just amazingly. And this is because we're not only taking, of course, uh, this one input, the, uh, the, the language itself, but we're also taking into account physiological data. So not only brain waves, but also eye tracking, for instance, or uh, movement patterns. And uh, so this is actually, I think, one of the exciting things to see also emerging in the future. So moving also from cloud services, like if you want to do some uh, cognitive processing through clouds, it's going to be also decentralized. And you will have devices that can perform basically magic. So, all right, enough of that. Um, so let me just talk about the Brain Duino project, actually. And, uh, okay, so it started actually two years ago, um, but also for a technician, it started almost 30 years ago. Um, so he was building the IBVA, one of the first mobile brain computer interfaces. And uh, so uh, then we made it the Brain Duino, actually, so it's the newest version. And so we already have uh, the Brain Duino as an Arduino shield. And a lot of users are already uh, happy with this. And now we're working on uh, using also the Arduino Pro Mini and also splitting the parts and making everything work actually at, as a headset. And uh, so, yeah, what the result is basically an EEG device that is very affordable and has very high data quality. So, and this is an open source project. Um, and, okay, so what can we do actually? We have uh, the Brain Duino, then we have a serial stream and you can use different software to process the data. There's open source um, software like OpenVibe, and we're currently working on Neuroflex. Um, so there's still a little cleanup hap um, happening with the code right now, um, but uh, it can be also be found in, um, at GitHub soon. And um, so what you basically want to do is signal processing, um, of course machine learning, and then you have outputs that say uh, something to visualize uh, with the open sound control or OpenGL, of course. So this is the basic idea. And yeah, like I said, how to participate in this project. We have a Slack 
and uh, GitHub, of course. And if you make it to Berlin, you're also welcome to join uh, the Meetup group there. So both on the software side as well as the hardware development, uh, we're looking for uh, people to help us with this, um, but also for design and also for neuro games, the things that uh, make this whole project fun. And uh, yeah, I would be happy to uh, talk to you about this. And uh, so what's the status quo? So currently we are um, processing, we're actually uh, manufacturing the first 100 devices. And um, so there's like a, uh, uh, like a pilot test uh, for the, uh, those people can, uh, so people can actually apply for one device. And uh, so, and at the same time, we're developing the software and really making it nice, uh, usable. And uh, like I said, push it to, to the GitHub also. And um, so yeah, we're looking for developers, of course, people to uh, participate in this project, and of course, uh, some funding. And uh, yeah, so let's maybe have a quick look. Let's see if I can just make this. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So I'm just going to show you a little bit. Um, so I heard like uh, it's better maybe we do the demo tomorrow. Um, but I can nevertheless want to show you something still. Okay. So let's give it a try. And um, so this is software right now. And so that's what I also mean. So here we have actually the data coming in. Um, excuse the resolution, um, it's usually on the full HD. Um, so yeah, we have something coming in actually, and uh, those are actually brain waves. Um, and we have different ways of uh, also visualizing them. And uh, yeah, and then we put this actually into a little game. Um, it is a, it's actually a flight simulator, and uh, I'm not sure if I can do this right now. Maybe I'm a little bit too stressed, but, but I can give it a try. Um, so the idea is to make it able to fly higher um, if I focus on it really good. So I give it a try. Uh, one second. Base. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Right, right now. Um, yeah. So that's what I mean. It's <laughs> data can be noisy, but uh, all right. Let's, um, okay. Maybe that's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a way of uh, showing it. It also actually stopped. So like, uh, that's very typical, maybe. Um, yeah, but uh, maybe yeah, we can go over to the um, to the questionnaire, uh, to the Q and A. Uh, and like I said, I would also uh, really enjoy to show you outside the demo. And we can uh, you can also try to run the flight simulator. And uh, yeah, all right. You know, you actually have uh, a lot more time. Yeah. <laughs> show some. Is there anything else you can show? Um, yeah, yeah. Let's just see you stressed out. Okay. <laughs> this is actually maybe. Here, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one second. Um, all right. Yeah. So. How do we know you're check. stressed? Okay. So how do I know I'm stressed? Yeah. I can show maybe uh, here. You have the higher uh, brainwave activity. All right. I'm gonna make you stress, 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 stress. Okay. Is all right. Here you go. Difference? Um, well. Yeah, just slightly, <laughs> of course. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, but I can I can maybe show what happens when I just uh, relax for just okay, uh, brief moments. Okay, I'll try to relax in front of the crowd. <sighs> doesn't seem to change. No. What? No, you look this? more stressed. <laughs> <But look> at, <laughs> no. <laughs> Oh wait, no. Uh, look at this. So, um, so the color is basically the, the dark red is the very high activity, and uh, the more it gets blue and this yellow. So, like this was the phase actually where I was just uh, relaxing ah. for a short moment. Okay. And, uh, yeah. All right. So. Uh, any questions from the audience? Any questions from the audience? Great. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I guess I have just a question about the raw data. Um, so uh, I noticed that it looks like it's uh, coming in at a fairly low frequency. I was just wondering, like, what is that? A, uh, I guess what is the range of frequencies of interest when you're doing EEG, and um, what uh, what frequency do you sample at? Um, sorry, the la the last part. Um, what frequency do you sample at? Ah, okay. Um, so uh, what's important is to um, have a range, let's say, between 
actually starting at uh, 0 point, let's say 0 point 0.1 um, hertz and then going all the way up to 40 hertz, 50 hertz, or something like that. And um, but uh, so like the most uh, the com most common activity you have actually between 0 point uh, uh, something to 40, and that's why we also made like a bandpass filter here, so you can see right now the filter mode is on, and so it go goes roughly also only to 40 hertz. Um, this is really also where we want to look in particular. So, but of course we sample more, um, so it's not only. Uh, uh, so until so it's not like 80, so you have the Nyquist theorem, you have, have double the samples, but we can go up to uh, 1,300 samples per second, and um, this is also great. Also, if you want to do, uh, let's say, classification, if you have a lot of data points, and also for um, discerning between, let's say, noise and uh, the actual brainwave signal. Yeah. Okay. Right. And, and um, I guess yeah. what. Um, signal or what uh, techniques do you use to process the brainwave? So like I assume you, you mentioned a couple different utilities, but what's kind of the most common thing to use? Uh, utilities, you mean like a, like a pipeline of processing or? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically you have, um, uh, what you do is, um, um, because also you have uh, effects like the DC drift, so um, because of this, um, basically how it works, how the reading, and so what you want to do is, um, it's called like a, like a DC drift correction or a baseline correction, so you bring it up actually, um, as you can see also in the, in the raw data plot here, um, so you see that it's kind of moving up and down, and um, so this is actually what, what we first have to do, is to um, basically uh, remove like an average uh, signal value, um, this baseline correction, and then you do um, also filtering, um, and uh, so something like a bandpass filter. Uh, what we currently use is um, like a Butterworth and Butterworth, and you can um, t uh, say, okay, I, I want to start. Um, so, like in this example, we start around 0.5 uh, and then go all the way up to 40. And uh, so then the next thing, uh, depending on the on the task, of course, um, for the P300, for instance. Um, on the one hand, from the application, you're showing some, some image, let's say. Uh, one example is maybe with um, people that you know um, or people that you don't know. So, um, uh, so you know the exact moment when you are showing um, the image, and at the same time, you're having a little data window. Uh, you're tracking the brain waves. And um, that, that gives you actually the way to put this, the, the samples actually into uh, a different um, processing, um, like for instance, um, you can put this in uh, support vector machines, like the older technologies, but you can also actually uh, use something like um, TensorFlow, um, like for instance, WaveNet, because it's, it's basically, it's waves, so uh, you can uh, treat it the same way you treat audio, um, and that makes it also very interesting, I think. And um, yeah, so like this is one of the things how I would say uh, you can work with this uh, currently with uh, using current, current technologies. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I have a question here. Hello. Oh. Uh, please don't take photos. Thank you. Ah. Yeah, I have a question here uh, because uh, thoughts are running simultaneously in the brain. So, on the subject of stress, uh, one has positive stress and negative stress. And on top of that, because uh, you have. A lot of people, uh, for instance myself, I, I can think of like 20 tasks at the same time and even go down to details. So some tasks have a lot of positive stre stress and some have very negative. So my question here is uh, how many channels you can have and uh, how do you do the arithmetic between the different kind of stress? and? Uh, and also, I'd like to know a little bit more on your filtering process. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, different kinds of stress. Um, that's actually a good question. Um, and uh, one has to, there we have to look a little bit uh, deeper also, of course, in the data. Um, because um, they can, of course, be different unfoldings. And actually, if you want to classify it, it may look the same to some extent. But uh, if you, for instance, look at the uh, the phases, so you only, not only have the, the frequency and the amplitude, but you also have a phase, like, you know, the positive phase of one wave, and then, for instance, um, what you can do is you can look at the synchrony. You can look at how much is the left and the right hemisphere synchronized, 
Um, this gives you like a, a different interpretation um, possibility. So, uh, like let's say a positive stress would be if you have a very high synchrony uh, there. Um, uh, so like a de-stress. And on the other hand, if you're stressed uh, and let's say you don't know what to do or something, then it's different. Then you have more like a chaotic, non-synchronized activity. Um, but yeah, so that's not. Uh, um, so yeah, depending on the on the software that you use, of course, those those kind of um, overlapping or let's say statistical errors um, uh, can can happen if you don't consider something like this, um, because. If you just look at the amplitudes, okay, it looks like, oh yeah, the, the beta waves are rising, and oh yeah, okay, this is probably stress. But yeah, um, you're right, this cannot be actually a process of something positive. Um, yeah, and so uh, with the Brain to Eno, we can go up to uh, 16 channels um, with the unipolar uh, measurement and eight channels with uh, bipolar. So currently, what I'm using is um, one setup with uh, four electrodes. And um, so also with this uh, setup right now, I could also look at the synchrony. And um, yeah, sorry, I didn't understand the, the last part was uh, something about the, the outlook or, oh, sorry. All right, we only have one yeah. uh, time for one more last question, okay? okay? I had a question, um, so oh, I wanted to ask how many sensors is the, your setup using? So. My, many other uh, devices that measure EEGs, there's something like the NeuroSky, they have just like one electrode that's placed on the forehead. So is the brain do we know using more sensors and how accurate is it? Um, yeah, so we use, uh, um, so right now for this, yeah, there's like uh, devices that only use one sensor. You can do uh, certain tests, of course, you can do like this um, very simplified, um, uh, yeah, like uh, looking at the arousal state, like how awake am I or am I sleepy? Um, have I been drinking coffee and, and so on? Um, and so uh, with the Brain Duino, we have um, four electrodes at hand and we want to differentiate basically in the prefrontal cortex between the left and the right hemisphere. Um, okay. Yeah. So but uh, like the EEG machines which are used in the medical industry, like the hospitals, so they actually have an entire like cover kind of ah. thing and they have like multiple electrodes. So how accurate is your measurement while taking four? Because yeah. they kind of have one electrode per lobe of the brain. Right. So um, yeah, so like uh, for, if you want to do, um, of course, if you want to do the, 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 ground, uh, the basic research, if you want to find, find out about processes maybe that are only theory currently, um, of course, then you would look for a cap. Uh, in that way, but um, they're actually right now uh, there's research emerging that is showing that you only need a few electrodes um, and you can already make a very precise uh, interpretation there um, and also yet yeah, um, according to the um, the signal quality, this is also what is basically comparable to um, uh, medical devices that we can offer with Brain Duino. Um, and uh, so one of the applications, for instance, uh, what they are currently looking into is uh, a way of also um, bringing in stimulation, um, sensory stimulation, and uh, therefore you don't need actually the, the whole cap. It uh, can be done with a few electrodes. Yeah. But I can also tell you more about this later. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. With that, thank you very much, uh, Willie. A round of yeah. applause for him on uh, EG. Very interesting.